Welcome to today's 3D print. Today we are going to just do a quick update of what's going on here. I got a few prints that I'm working on. I've had multiple failures of Voyager. It turns out that um, the um, printing Z is an interesting material. Um, the stiction is very, very good. So if you have a print attached to print and Z and you attempt to pull the print off the print and Z, good luck. It's not coming off. <laughs> not easily at least. But if I were to take this part and squeeze it like that, it would pop right off the print and Z. As soon as you warp the surface a little bit, it comes right off nice and clean. Okay? Um, it's kind of like a suction cup. You can't really pull it off. You got to pry up the edge of it and then the suction cup just pops off. That's kind of how print and Z works. Um, what was happening is when this begins to print, it is three independent prints, this, this, and this. And when um, I have a, a 20 millimeter brim disc that I use to hold the, this one on, what was happening is the brim disc was small enough that it was able to warp a little bit. And it would warp enough under pressure from the nozzle pushing on it since the CR-10 is not as precise as the Ender. Not because it's worse, just because it's 300 by 300 millimeters and this is only 150 by 150 millimeters. So it's possible for this to hold tolerances much easier than it is for a CR-10. So that's why the prints on the Ender look so good. It's basically a tiny CR-10. Um, as you get bigger, that's a consequence of getting bigger. It turns out all I needed to do was simply make the brim disc huge. I just made one single, one layer, but a huge brim disc. So that you had to warp a lot more of it to actually make anything pop off. Worked perfectly got the bottom half of Voyager printed and this is significantly larger than the other one. Yeah, big difference. <laughs> so this is going to be cool. This is also in a, a light gray color which more closely resembles the actual color of the ship which is cool. Now, I noticed on the CR-10 that the one thing I love about my Enders is that there's no artifacts. There was basically no ringing, no ghosting, none of that exists. It is virtually impossible to get rid of that on the CR-10 so far. I haven't figured out a way to get rid of it. I have jerk turned down to 2 and I had the speed turned down to 50% which is about 15 millimeters per second. Basically I am about 30% done the front half of the Starship and um, it's um, taken 12 hours to get there. So that's like a 40 hour print just for the front half. But that's how slow I have to run to get rid of the artifact. It'll print fine if I go faster, it'll print great. I mean, and it looks fine, but I want perfect. I mean, look how nice these details are coming out. Now, I tried raising the speed. Just I don't even know if you can see this in the, um, the video. But I tried raising the speed just a little bit from 50% to 60% and the ghosting and artifacts was very visible in the surface of the model. Actually, you can see it. Let's see if we can get that. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but basically, from here down was at 50%, from here to here was at 60%, and then from here up, back down to 50%. And you can actually visibly see that the surface, oh yeah, that is coming out. The surface in this section is just not as nice. The surface here is very nice. The surface in this section is just not as nice. And that's that little bit of speed difference. So it looks like a, a certain threshold is being passed when I go past like 15, 20 millimeters a second. That um, on less detailed models, oh, you can really see it here, wow. You can really see it in the surface of this thing right here. The two points are at the different speed. And you can see the difference in the surface quality. Right there, that's a good shot. Um, another thing I noticed is that so many details in this ship, it's, it's incredible how detailed this model is. So many details in this ship are appearing now that I'm making it big enough. Like this was just a solid piece. These are the impulse drive engines. But now they have all these details in them that aren't there before. Uh, little details in things like this. Little details in there that aren't present on the smaller model. Uh, even the phaser bank um, rails. These lines right here are where the phaser, are the phaser emitters, I believe. Um, they're all visible now. All these little hatch details that are visible now, that weren't visible before. Um, 
but yeah, it's cool. I mean, even these little nubs, lights, navigation lights, they, they weren't there on the small one either. It's, in, it's incredible. The, look at the look at the um, um, the shuttle bay doors. Even the doors visible now. Details, really, really incredibly detailed models this guy has. Um, he get, I, he actually gets them from some game or something like that. I'm gonna download all of them just to store them. I think I'm actually missing more details because I notice it's attempting to print details here that aren't quite showing up right. So I think larger that the de details could be even better. It might be worth one day um, making this a three-piece model so I can double the size again because I think I can go about another 50% larger if I were to make it multiple pieces um, instead of two pieces. But for this one, I just wanted to keep it two pieces because I prefer two pieces. But yeah, so that'll be coming soon once the other half is done and I print that, put them together. Now, something else cool. Why does this turn off? I hate when it does that. i got to figure out how to turn off that. I have the screen dimming turned off. I wonder if it's something in the actual television doing it. Uh, but I found this on Thingiverse. And it's a big pen holder. It's basically a pen body. It's the body of a pen. And you put your ink fill in it. And, well, as you can see, it's a little double helix. There's a ball on the other end. I can't show it to you. This is a screen grab. So, um, yeah. Failed. Failed. And I got like two more that I can't find. Failed, failed, failed. <laughs> this is where print settings come into play. Now, if you've been watching my videos, you kind of have an idea of what my print settings are. For the Ender 2, I use 5mm retract, point, negative 0.45mm restart, um, 0.2mm coast. Remember that negative 0.45 millimeter restart. That's going to come into play pretty soon. Um, it took me a while to finally get it to actually print the pen. And I'm going to give you a close-up of that in a minute. What was weird was it would print the the tip of the pen no problem. Great, perfect as usual. I mean, like literally perfect. The, the smoothness on this finish is really quite dramatic. I hope that's, fo I think it is focusing. How close can I get? Oh, I can get pretty close. The finish on that is just dramatic. So, when it got to the point where it was printing the spirals, it just stopped printing. At first I thought it was temperature, that maybe it just couldn't, the plastic wasn't fluid enough to come out at, because it was doing such tiny little, as you can see, it's doing such tiny little extrusions there we go. Such tiny little extrusions, they're hard to do. So I thought maybe the tiny extrusions were giving it a problem, but it was just going zzz, 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 and it just couldn't get enough plastic out. So I cranked up the temperature and that helped a little bit. This was just nothing. And this got little nubs. And then um, when I was getting ready to start the 4-3 try, I reprimed the printer because there was always a little oozing plastic. So I you know I, I squeezed the the feeder lever and I pushed plastic in and two things happened. One, I pushed a lot of plastic in. I mean, push, 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 push. I was like, what the hell? And then I realized I was feeling teeth marks on the filament, like eight inches of it. And I was like, why am I, the, the filament is smooth. The filament is smooth. This is a different filament, but you'll get the idea. But when this filament goes through the feeder on the printer, that gear that grabs the filament, pushes it against the idler, and feeds it into the Bowden tube, marks it. It puts tool marks on the filament. And you can feel those. You usually don't see it because it goes through and then gets melted, so you never see it. Something keeps biting me. I'm going to find it and kill it. <laughs> uh, GBE, growl, bite, eat. That's the solution to everything. Growl at it. If that don't work, bite it. If that don't work, eat it. Then it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> so, can you figure out why it wasn't printing? You have all the data you need. Everything there is what you need is there. Negative 0.45 millimeter restart. Think about what that means. That means you're at zero. You retract five millimeters. 
Well, you have to push back five millimeters to get back to zero, and then you begin extruding plastic again. Well, to stop my to attempt to stop my zitting, I put a negative 45 retract in, restart retract. So what that means is, let's say I have one millimeter retract. So I pull back one millimeter, and then I push back forward again a millimeter to get me back to zero. But I have it set for a negative 0.45 restart, which means I pull back one millimeter, but only push forward. 0.55 millimeters. Okay, now if you draw another 20 millimeters of filament, you're fine. But what happens if I pull back one millimeter and then push forward 0.55 millimeters and then only push 0.2 millimeters of plastic? Well, I never got back to zero before I hit my next one millimeter retract, 0.55 millimeter restart. So, in the end, because each of the nubs of the spiral <coughs> is less than 0.45 millimeters of plastic, you actually never get back to zero. Your, your commands are actually causing it to pull the filament out of the printer instead of pushing filament into the printer. Because your grand total number of retracts exceeds your grand total number of extrusions. <laughs> so, because it was printing something so tiny, it was actually pulling the filament back out of the printer 0.2 millimeters at a time, each time it did one of those retractions. And of course it did one of those retractions every time it went from one to another to another to another to another to another. So the total number of retracts exceeded the total number of extrusions in total distance. So, I changed the retract to one millimeter, I lowered the temperature down to 190 to help control oozing, and I set the um, restart retraction and coast to zero. And that worked. Or I was still at 210. PLA, Esun's PLA Pro likes 210. And the result of that was, you can see this is all the cooked filament that was in the nozzle, but the result of that was this beautiful print. It actually came out quite beautiful, but there's a bit of string in there. I was like, this is a gorgeous print. I would be. A year ago, I would have been tickled pink to get this out of any printer. But I said, I can do better. <laughs> and I'm doing this at a layer height of 0.12. Because that's a multiple of my stepper order. Here is the new one. With virtually zero string. Look at that print. I am blown away by how nice this came out. And it's strong, too. You know, it doesn't want to break. I was able to break one, but it took substantially more force than I would apply to it during our normal usage. Look at that. Now, he says you need the Bic crystal pens, but I found out that the Bic round stick M fits fine. And you can get them at the dollar store for 10, 10 back for a buck. Um, just take your knife and cone the top of this a little bit, just a little bit. The, I, I believe this is a hair thicker than the one he says to use, and it goes right in. So now I have a gorgeous pen. The only real stringing is the bottom of the ball, the sphere up top, because there's actually nothing inside there supporting. Because he designed this to print like this, with support laying down on a print bed. I printed it like this. <laughs> vertically. I printed this vertically, like this. Just like that. <laughs> and that's all the brim I used. <laughs> that is a testament to how incredibly good this Ender 2 printer is, and how incredibly precise it is, and how good the Print and Z print surface is. And that's a single layer brim. That's 1.12 millimeter layer. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I did make it two, so it's 0.24 millimeters, equivalent to a single 0.2 millimeter layer. And look at the resolution detail in this thing. Look how smooth. Oh, there's a good shot. Look how absolutely smooth that tip is. And look at the ball. There it goes. It is so incredibly smooth. The whole print is just amazing. And it's strong. There's no voids. There's no issues. Absolutely beautiful. 
it, it never ceases to amaze me what I can get out of this 200 freaking dollar printer. <laughs> it's why I have three of them and I plan to get another one. Um, I, I would like to have a few more of these, okay, it's just a matter of money. Because I print everything with these things. Everything. And we're soon going to talk about springs, too. I finally found some replacement springs to get rid of these crap springs. I found springs like the springs on the CR-10, but stiffer. Um, stay away from the mediums. They are way too stiff. I mean, I can't squeeze these for jack. I mean, I can squeeze them, but way too tight. Way, 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 way too tight. Well, these might be good on a printer where 20 millimeters is almost not long enough. And so you have to compress them down to get any real um, grip. That might help with that. But otherwise, basically there's four levels that I found. You have heavy load, medium load, light load, and extra light load. The CR-10 uses extra light load. So I got light load springs, which are stiffer. These are actually 10 millimeter wide. I have 8 millimeter coming in, which fits perfectly over the bolts. And I have more of these coming in too, because those work great on the Ender 2. I now have them on my Ender 2, and my bed level isn't sloppy anymore. It doesn't move around. Um, although I did discover my bed is not perfectly flat, so I really should be putting a piece of glass on it. So I will be putting a piece of glass on the other two. Um, before, I'll be putting a Pritten Z on top of a piece of glass. I just got... I'll make sure they're flat, but I just got some dollar store Fisher frames with the thin glass because I can't go too thick or I'll reach the maximum compression of the springs and then I'll have to move the Z-stop and I prefer not to mess with that. So um, the trick I'm finding is I really like sticking the Print and Z to the bed surface because no binder clips. It just works. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. If I could figure out a way to drill holes in the glass without breaking the glass, that would be ideal because then I can just epoxy some magnets into the glass. If I put nine magnets in the glass and then put nine magnets on the print bed, that ain't going to go nowhere. It's, there's nothing this is going to print that will overcome the force of those magnets. And then I could have a removable print bed as well, but also one that um, doesn't have any binder clips. So I'm, I'm working on trying to figure that out. But um, for now, I guess I could adhere the glass to the print bed and then it prints you the glass. You know, just put some transfer tape down. It's only six by six inches, but that would give me a flatter surface um, because I do for single prints it's completely irrelevant but I do a lot of sequential prints where I'm printing part 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 I print nine parts on the bed eight parts three three and two for four sets of um, um, motor retention kits these little things the little motor retainers I can print nine of these at a time on a print bed so to do four sets I print eight because you have the male and female but, um, that keeps turning off, whatever. But, um, yeah, it's, this is amazing. This is incredible. I, I got all kinds of ideas. I'm going to make my own of these. Um, he even provides instructions showing you how to do it, I believe. So I'm going to learn how to do it, and I'm going to make my own. And then I'm going to start replacing the ball with different things, like a little pizza slice or a rocket or maybe a little 3D printer head. <laughs> Actually, that'd be pretty cool little 3D, little hot end like that, you know, put that up um, on top of here, just different designs you put on top of here, and it's an actually nice usable pen, it's a talking piece, I'm going to make it different colors, I think I'm going to grab some of what I have left of that bronze PLA from Push Plastic and try that out, I think that would look cool, but the pen is cool, you want to hardcore test your printer, go grab this and try printing it like that, <laughs> but the cool thing is, no support, no nothing, you just... I think I could even automate this. Like, uh, that that might actually be a legitimate reason to get Octoprint. <laughs> I could very easily program this thing, especially if you can actually control physical movement with Octoprint. Let it use a slightly smaller brim, let it cool down, and just move the print head back, bring the Z-arm down, and just like purposely crash right into the pen. Just knock it off the print bed, then tell it to print another one, and then tell it to print another one, and then tell it to print another one. One thing I haven't tried, I bet you I can sequential print these. I bet you I can easily do four. If I do one here, and then move back a little bit to clear the X arm, do one here, then come back here again, do one here, and then come back here again, do one here. I could do four of these. 
You can't do two in line because the arm would hit. So I can do the motor retention in line because the motor retention is shorter than the gap between the arm and the um, bed when it's at zero, zero. But these will obviously be too tall for that. But if I do one here and then go back and do one here, then do one here and then go back and do one here, I can do four of these on the print bed. That's um, 12 hours of printing at a slow speed, so that's not a problem with needing to log in and redo them. But um, these are beautiful. I got I got two other ones that I found on Thingiverse. I'm going to try to print them out when I get a chance. And I want to try different colors, but these are very, very cool. Um, I will have more later on the springs. Um, if you want to mess with the pen, I'll have links to the PLA down below and links to where you can get the pens down below. I found them on Amazon, um, 7 bucks for 24 of them. But if you have a Dollar Tree, well I appreciate using the links, if you got a Dollar Tree near you, just go buy a pack of the, the Bic Round Stick Extra Life pens. They work fine. It's perfect. And that's, a, that's 10 cents a piece. So, much better deal. I'm um, going to have another review coming up soon. I found a wicked cool gadget. I'm praying it works okay. I'm really, really hoping it's not junk because it looks cool as hell. Power strip. Vertical power strip. This thing is badass. It's got four USB ports and it's got 10 110 volt outlets rated for 2500 watts and it's got a power strip for each portion of the stack. Nice wide base with feet handle to carry it and the coolest part the cord wraps up inside it's a pain in the ass getting it out you gotta kinda pull it as you turn it kind of thing like that and it's got a long cord too this is like a third of it or a quarter of it but wrapping it back up is easy you just turn the handle and spin the whole thing and the cord wraps back up but this is very good for storing it for travel when I go on my trips from now on this is what I'll bring just this I'll have four USB ports, and I'll have um, my 10 outlets, which is way more than I'll ever need. Actually, I'm thinking about getting a short stack. They have a little one that's um, four outlets and USB ports, something like that, because I, I, I don't use AC very much when I travel. I use one of these. And it's got 10 USB ports on it, and two, including two QC quick charge ports, Qualcomm quick charge for my phone. I just use one of these, and I power everything off this. So I really only need two AC outlets, one for this and one for my laptop. Everything else, all my camera chargers, everything. I, I made it a point to get, um, you know, my, this is an AC one, but I made it a point to get battery chargers for all my cameras that are USB powered, so I can plug everything into USB. The advantage of being able to plug everything into USB is I just carry a bunch of USB cables with me and I use one of these and I can charge 10 things simultaneously but it also means that I can plug into solar panels, I can plug into car chargers, house chargers, um, generators, things like this, battery packs, I mean you can just plug into anything. USB is just extremely convenient and extremely universal. So I'm trying to get everything USB powered but for at home this thing is freaking cool. So um, before I, you know, I'll provide a link down below to get it because it is a nice little unit. But before I'll give my heartfelt go get it, I'm gonna run it through the ringer first. But that's gonna take a while because I don't just plug things in and say, hey, go get it. <laughs> I gotta use it. I gotta make sure I like it. I gotta see how things fit, how the plugs fit. I'll probably pull it apart. You know, I'm guessing there's screws underneath here and I can pull this little bugger apart. Um, I see screws on here so I can open this thing up and see how it's built inside. I do. I was worried about this um, mechanism here. I I don't. I've had devices before where when you turn them, it's actually a uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, I forgot what it's called. There's a name for it. A crown ring or something like that. It's in your steering steering wheel of your car. There's a um, two discs. And the wires are connected to this disc, and the wires are connected to this disc, and those two discs touch and make the electrical contact, which allows it to rotate without twisting up wires inside. And um, for 12 volt DC, it's unreliable. So I sure don't want that for this, but it's not. The wire is attached because you hit a, st a hard stop when you get it all the way out, and you can pull it both ways. So the wire is actually attached, it's just attached and reeled up inside. So this space is where you can see through the bottom here 
it's where the wire is being wrapped around the spool in the middle so that's good that means there's a solid connection to the wire inside there but this thing is cool I really really like this thing I'm, I'm, this is cool I got two of them uh, something else I'm working on is my fin cans so this is an all-in-one fin can it's designed to um, have the motor retention built in so the little motor retention things that I make are actually built into this fin can this will actually accept a um, a T52H motor mount tube because you, you, the plastic would melt if it got directly exposed to the ejection gas um, so you slide your T52H tube into here, glue it in place and it goes all the way down to the bottom and hits this retention ring on the bottom and then you get one of these and you just thread that on there to hold your motor in place and this is four perimeters and hollow so this whole thing is super strong and this is the bottom of the rocket this is the fin can and then on the other end of the rocket you'd have the, the nose cone as you saw so let me show you the complete rocket I still have to build on launch rails for it but you're not going to be able to see the whole thing but here's the whole rocket so on this end inside of here there's a paper tube going up to about here and then there's one of these at the top to, to center that tube and to seal it and also you through those two holes there you put your Kevlar shock cord and that comes out the top and that's where your parachute attaches so that whole piece is all 3D printed and I can show you here your motor it stops when it goes in and you're able to extract your motor change it, you can see inside here there's a paper tube can you see in there? not really but there's a paper tube in here and it goes up to about here and um, you, you prepare your motor slide your motor in, it stops so it can't shoot out that end of the rocket and then this threads on the back so that the motor can't come out that end of the rocket and now your motor is positively retained there's your fin can I still have to put guidance on here, rail button or rail I'm thinking about making a longer rail so this can launch on 1010 rail and then um, make it look like a scale um, design effect it will make it actually a part of the design of the rocket it would look neat and be easy to print and then um, you know of course you have your nose cone um, and it's beveled so easy insertion into the rocket while still giving you a nice snug fit um, the fit on these parts is so tight they're not even glued together that if I take the motor and slam it into the bottom of the rocket the compression of air inside the tube is enough to pop the nose cone off <laughs> that's pretty good that's pretty darn good you're not going to see it in there but yeah about it goes to about there half the length uh, so you have all this space here to put your parachute, your avionics whatever you want to put in there so that will be one of my first rocket kits that I actually sell and it came out very cool I'm very pleased with it I printed, I'm printing them out in a couple different colors gigabyte limit it records to 3.97 gigabytes and stops for some reason it doesn't restart so it's about 27, 27 and a half minutes um, so I did one in black and one in white these are all printed, well actually this is printed on the CR10 um, and then this one here on the CR-10 as was the red one and then this one here was printed on the ANET E-10 and it did a very good job now I noticed that the edges of the bottom of the fins two come out really nice and two come out really bad and I have to clean them up but on the ANET E-10 all four are clean I'm like what's the difference it's the same exact file not the same file I did have to redo it for the ANET E-10 because on the CR-10, I print it like this. But on the ANET E-10, this is wider than the print bed of the ANET E-10. But not if I rotate it 45 degrees. It will fit if I rotate it 45 degrees, so the print bed is like this. And so that allows me to use the ANET E-10. And um, any printer that has a 220 millimeter print height can print this. So that new printer I'm getting from your best will be able to print this. Um, which is great because it takes 18 hours. <laughs> But, um, and it's heavy, it's like four tenths of a pound. But, um, 400 grams, 450 grams. So now I got the starting, I, I watched it print and I realized it's because it was starting the layer on the point. 
which is not good because the, the point is slightly unstable because it's the end of a run so I'm thinking doing this on the E10 caused it to make the start point somewhere else so I'm going to try that on the CR10 too instead of printing it like this I'm going to print it like this on the CR10 and see if that changes the start point so that whatever imperfections there are aren't on the edge of the fin which will eliminate me having to do any cleanup <laughs> um, I was thinking about trying to do this in ABS but I don't think there's a point because uh, first of all ABS hates overhangs like this you know that is a hard overhang and there's no info this is empty it's just four perimeters um, but also um, ABS has weaker layer adhesion and it's a weaker material PLA is about 7,000 PSI while ABS is only like 4,200 PSI so it's almost half the physical strength of PLA and it has like half the layer bonding strength of PLA so um, the only advantage to ABS is glass transition temperature so I'm going to have to perform an experiment I'm going to have to try to anneal this because there are PLAs that can get you ABS glass transition temperature better than ABS glass transition temperatures. Um, the, this PLA right here supposedly can handle um, like 180 degrees once you anneal it before it would hit its glass transition temperature. And um, although that's very expensive, I can do you know like I can do these things in that, but it wouldn't be practical to do these in that because I would only get, let's see, half a pound, 4, 8, 12, 16, I'd get 5 out of each roll assuming no errors, which means each one would cost me 8 bucks. That's a lot. Using PLA, each one cost me like 3 bucks. Uh, regular PLA. So I want to try to keep this kit. 50 bucks. I want to try to keep it around $50 if I can. I would like to make my target price $49.99. Most manufacturers sell a kit like this for $60 or $70. So I want to try to keep my target price for this kit ready to go with parachutes, everything you need, for 50 bucks. So um, to meet that price point and have any meat left over for me, I really can't use the Raptor PLA. But um, as long as they keep it out of the heat, the, the rocket heat's not a problem. That's irrelevant. Don't worry about the rocket heat. Um, I've been flying these motor retainers on dozens of flights. They never experience enough heat. As long as you don't have the rocket sitting on the blast deflector plate, it's never going to experience enough heat to be a problem. Um, but um, the, the problem is, in a hot car, I don't know what will happen to this. So, I'm going to try annealing this. Because you can anneal regular PLA. Regular PLA will also anneal. And the trick is keeping it straight, keeping it from warping. I don't think these will warp because they have geometric structure so I think these will be okay my concern is the tolerances of this hole this is over toleranced but the section down here that the tube actually inserts into is well toleranced the tube actually is a nice friction fit you can see this thing is it's holding itself together and there's no glue I haven't glued it you can't fly it like that you gotta glue it but the tolerances are nice enough that it's holding itself together like that and then you also have to have sufficient tolerances to be able to thread this on and hold the motor in place and also this needs to be able to slide through this open end and fit in place and then this needs to be able to thread on top so what I'm thinking is if I actually put a, um, an empty motor casing and a paper tube in here and then stick it in the oven like that, all together, everything all together, then the parts should change together or resist changing beyond spec and everything should stay to where it will fit. So I'm going to try that and we'll see what happens. Don't know if it'll work. It's a pure guess on my point, on my part. So we shall see. If anybody knows of a cheaper PLA that can be annealed to a glass temperature above 100, because if I can get to an anneal glass transition temperature of above even, say, 85, 90 C, that'll be enough to exceed any temperature you're ever going to reach inside of a hot car. 
the, the max temperature inside of a hot car is about 100. I think the max recorded temperature inside of a hot car is 172 Fahrenheit. So what is that? Convert 172 Celsius to Fahrenheit. No. Convert 172 Fahrenheit to Celsius. 172 degrees Fahrenheit equals 78, 78 degrees. degrees. So Celsius. if I can pass, say, 85 degrees Celsius glass transition temperature, I'm golden. Um, as long as they don't have the thing being crushed under something when it gets softer. If I can get the glass transition temperature above 85C, we're good. That's all I need because there is no such thing as a car getting hotter than that. Or if there is, you're in such an exotic environment that um, I don't have to worry about you buying PLA parts. <laughs> but um, let's see, what else? Oh, I printed one of those cute octopuses. Ah, isn't that cute? I made them big. This is all hollow. Uh, I think it's two or three perimeters. And um, just this part has infill because I was worried about this closing. So I put 25% infill just on this top section right here. You can see where it's a, see so yeah, right there, you can see the transition line. So that part has infill. And um, the zipper line is interesting. It's right here. So he's kind of got like a Harry Potter scar. <laughs> and um, you guys um, remember the, uh, the other octopus I printed, the, the more natural looking octopus? Well. I put them together with the cute octopus and they turned a little violent. The octopus said, DINNER! <laughs> He's gonna eat them. <laughs> He's even got an open mouth saying, yum, 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 I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> yeah, that came out very, very cool. And I got a, a mega version of him on my next mega print episode. You'll see a mega version of this one. This is printed on the ANET E10. And it came out really nice. And it's all hollow. No support anywhere. This is all hollow. Yeah, it is all I'm pretty sure this is all hollow. Yeah, this is all hollow. I didn't do any support anywhere. Or any um, infill. Of course I did no support. But he came out very cool. And the E10 did a wonderful job on him. This is um cheap extra land PLA. I mean, this is like, like $13, $14 a kilogram. This stuff is so cheap, it's crazy. And it prints beautifully. I have no complaints. <laughs> I love the cheap stuff. I'm not too thrilled with the red. <laughs> I don't think the plastic is a problem. I think whatever they use to color it, it just, it doesn't look as nice. It's got a, a cheap look to it. I mean, I'm not thrilled with the red. It's not bad. It's plenty strong. I mean, it works fine. I think I just don't like the color. But the black came out great. Very, very cool. Is that about the right size? No, he's a little bigger. No! You're eating my buddy! Ha ha ha! He's dinner. <laughs> but it looks like he put like an, a predator-like mouth on him. And he's got his tentacle wrapped around him. Let's ignore the fact that that one tentacle is about three times longer than the other ones. But who cares? It's cool as hell. The same guy who made this octopus is the one who made this combo of the two together. So I will obviously have a link down below for this model. I think it's a Bybee factory. Very, very pleased. This came out cool. I love this model. This is great. And the, this is great for the E10 because this is about as big as I can make it on the CR10 too because it's longer than it is wide. So you're going to hit a limit lengthwise before you hit a limit Z-wise. So the oblong bed of the E10 was perfect for it. I was like, screw it, throw it on E10. I had the, the CR10s printing other stuff that were more important to me. And this is a decorative print that I just liked. So I just I threw the cheapest roll of black PLA I had on there. The same black PLA that made this, by the way. So I've got to say, it's pretty damn good PLA. I mean, it prints nice. Both of these came off the CR10. Or the, the ANET E10. Both of these came off the ANET E10. This came off the Ender 2. This, you can print that big on the Ender 2. Because it's got basically a 6 by 6 inch bed. It's just a hair under 6 inches. Actually, the one dimension probably is 6 inches. I was able to squeeze 162 millimeters out of it. So I usually limit to 160. And then 151, 152 for the, um, the Y, so I just leave it at 150. 
but the Z height you can go to 225, which is nice because you can print nose cones with it. You know, I can't print um, these new nose cones I have. I can't print these on the Maker, the Maker Select or the Wand Help. This doesn't have enough Z height. It's um, how big is it? Would you knock it off? Stay put. It is 210 millimeters, so can't print this on the Maker Select or the Wand Help. But I can on the um, the A E10. I will be giving my final thoughts on the A E10 soon. They are pretty positive. It's got a lot of issues, and you need to fix those issues, especially the heat bed connection. <laughs> I sent them some advice on how I would fix that. I noticed that there's two unused pins that go to dual positive negative pins on the heat bed. I suspect if they were to double up the connectors through that plug, use both the positive and both the negative to go to the heat bed so that um, you had half the amperage going through each connector, I think that would solve the problem of that thing burning up. I think that would bring to within the spec tolerances of that plug. And uh, But for me, I just soldered it. I left the plug on there. I just I removed the plug, slid the actual contacts back over the pins, and then just pff, soldered the shit out of them. So it's solid now. It's not doing anything wrong. Um, I might add a MOSFET to that. Um, not so much that the internal one can't handle it, but if the internal one burns out, I don't want to damage the board since I don't know how easy it'd be to get another board. Although I understand it's just a standard A net board, their, their standard A net board. But um, for me, the MOSFET's not so much can the printer handle it, it's um, just redundancy. So in case, you know. I don't want to damage the board, so take the load off the board. The MOSFET's nine, it's like eight, nine bucks to replace if it burns out, so it's no big deal. But, um, oh, and by the way, look at the finish on this. Once again, this is Ender 2 finish. Virtually perfect. You'll notice it's not quite as perfect as my usual Ender 2 prints, but it's pretty damn close to perfect. Better than any other printer I have. I cranked that up to 200%. I think my standard print speed's like... 40, 45 millimeters a second. So it's probably hitting 35, 40 millimeter seconds on average. And I just turned it up to 200%. This thing was just going. Maybe not quite that fast, but pretty fast. And of course, it slowed down for the outside perimeter. And it's pretty beautiful. <laughs> That's great. The, the Ender 2 prints so free. I can't say enough about it. I mean, it's just. I, I have I have eight printers functional, nine if you count that freaking FL Sun Castle that drove me crazy. Uh, well, nine if you count my my MakerBot Mini that I still have brand new in the box. Um, mine died in multiple ways. They sent me a brand new one and I never opened it. I was like, screw it, and bought the Maker Select. Because <laughs> I needed bigger. It, it, it pretty good, but man, is that thing noisy. Uh, that plastic chamber around it resonated and it was one noisy bugger. It makes it makes the CR10 and the ANA E10 and the Maker Select sound quiet in comparison. But um, the printer itself wasn't noisy, it was just the chamber. As that head moved around, the whole chamber the whole chamber would resonate. And because I, cause I could make it quiet if I took it and grabbed it and held on to it. So I kept the panels from vibrating and it was quiet. So it was just that freaking plastic chamber acting as a resonance chamber and just But um, yeah, this is the kind of stuff you can get on the, oh, that's just a piece of filament from the table here. And that's the kind of the stuff from super tiny precise to big and fun to nose cones and centering rings and precision threads and big tall parts because it could do 225 millimeters. It's rated for 200, but I, I kept creeping it up. and I got the 225 quite safely, so to simplify, I set my vertical to 225. So you actually get a little more than you bargained for. And I have codes down below to get that for $163. I'm going to be using my own code to <laughs> buy another one as soon as I have the money. In fact, as soon as I get my first affiliate check from Amazon, um, if I don't, if I'm not behind on any bills, I'm probably going to use that to buy another Ender 2 because I really would like a fourth Ender 2, so that I can have, you know, you know, one doing nose, two doing nose cones, one doing centering rings, and one doing motor retention, and just just have them all cranking. I'll probably never even load different files onto them. 
just keep having them crank out or have three of them dedicated to cranking out my rocket parts and have the fourth one for me to print whatever nightly project I want to print. Um, I'm getting into small prints again just because when you can make them this nice and this is not really small, I mean, this, is a, this is a pretty decent sized print I mean, I wouldn't consider that tiny but um, for such a tiny printer, that's a pretty big print. Um, but it prints so well that I want to print things on it. <laughs> just because they come out so cool. And um, so I want to keep one end or two always free. You know, no long-term projects. So that I can always have one of them available for whatever flight of fancy I want to print. Ooh, so cool and thingiverse, print it. You know, have it available to print while the other printers are cranking out the um, things. Uh, one guy had a question about whether the CR-10 could actually do 200 hours server's life, you know, per print. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's Maybe I just got lucky, but I got two of them. These printers run 24-7. It's that simple. They, I keep them going. If, if I can't think of something to print, I reprint something I know I'm going to need. I Like, you know, the CR-10 this morning, I couldn't figure out what to put on it. And I didn't have enough time to change filament. I was like, screw it. Print another thing in. So I, I know I'm going to need it. So I just print another thing in. Um, you know, in between me finding long-term projects. Like, um, you know, this the, the ANET E10 finished printing this. So I, I sicked it on motor retainers. Told to print some motor retainers. Um... You know, yesterday or two days ago, it was done printing, you know, something else, and I told it, okay, print me a thing can. So I always keep the printers busy. The CR-10s are pretty much um, useless for day-to-day -day printing. <laughs> Not for you guys, for me, because I always have them working. I have a backlog of prints I want to perform on the CR-10s. That, that, that printer is doing the front half of Voyager right now. And when it's done doing that, each of them is going to be printing a part of um, Big Ben. I got a super scale Big Ben printing, like 600 millimeters tall, or 800 millimeters tall, you know, whatever it comes, 700 or 800 millimeters tall, the two halves, the bottom half and the top half. So I got a, a huge Big Ben queued up to print. I still want to print a Mega Benchy, just why not? Um, I'd love to make an RC Benchy, you know, a radio control one, eventually. I got a, a big uh, Marvin that I'd like to print one day, although I think I'm going to kill that one for now. Because I'd like to make it hollow and do what I did with the, um, decap cat you know, Revenge of the Cat. You know, make a big Marvin, but make it so I can open it. Um, but yeah, go from there. Um, I'd like to do more unibody rockets like that over there. I'd like to figure out more designs like the Vern style rocket. I'd like to try to figure out more ways to use that kind of construction technique just because I think it looks cool. Um, I protect those rockets with heat by having a paper tube going up the center, so all the exhaust gases and ejection charge are contained within the paper tube, so the actual aero shell, the rocket itself, never actually touches um, any kind of hot stuff. Like this here will have a paper tube inside of it, so none of this plastic will ever come into direct contact with any of the hot gases, so it never deforms. I will be running a dedicated video on the springs once I get more of them in, in that order. Um, also, um, I level by visual, but it was cheap enough, so why not? I'm going to play with using a dial indicator to level the print bed, so I'll play with that and see if, whatever. I mean, might as well. So I got one of the, I got a digital one, since I'm not going to sit there and read a dial. Screw that. And this one is digital. So we'll play with that. So that'll be an upcoming instructional video. Uh, if you guys have any particular questions that you want me to try to answer, you know, to make a video about, to to help you with a simplify 3D question or whatever, you know, anything you want. Um, if I can figure out how to do it, I will try to answer it. Um, anything else for now? I can't particularly think of anything else for now. I've got a bunch of other stuff here sitting on the desk, but you don't want to see it. You're forbidden. Not until it's done. It's going to be in the, the, the Mega Print episode once that's ready. Um, then we're, oh! Something else I found that's cool. 
another Dollar Tree find. I love Dollar Tree. These cool little um, organizer cases. Actually, nice ones. I mean, they're, they're kind of cool. So you have, you know, a couple of big compartments and a couple of small compartments. But it's just basically a, a compartmentalized organization thing. But what's really cool is, that, first of all, they're a little higher quality than your typical Dollar Tree stuff. But I figure I got one for each kind of printer I have. So I can put the spare parts and whatnot that I have for the printers in a case to separate them. But they have these little nubs, so they are stackable. So they stay put. So you can stack them. That's great. A dollar. I mean, hello, it's a freaking dollar. That's awesome. I love Dollar Tree. Like, what else do they get from Dollar Tree? Right? Might as well show you some of the junk I got from Dollar Tree. <laughs> um, they have USB wall adapters. I sell these at my store. A dollar, two amps, or oh, one amp. They have two amp dual outlet 12 volt car adapters, USB adapters. They're cheap, but they work. Um, some cool new micro USB cables. Then uh, my buddy at work likes green, so we got a green one. But I like how. Um, it's got the, what I consider the relatively heavy duty ends on there. They tend to hold up better. Uh, they also have these nice little metallic ones. We'll see if they're any good. Half the time they're junk, but sometimes you get gems that work really well. Like, um, I don't have one handy, but I got these orange and purple ones that just turned out to be very good cables. I bought a whole shit ton of them. Uh, what else? Oh, let's see. It's 25 feet? Yeah, 25 feet of power cord in orange. So I bought a bunch of them. These are great because um, you can snip off the tag here, and they're they're nice and handy for just keeping in your go bag, keeping in your glove box, keeping in your trunk, keeping in your toolbox, where you just need a little shank of rope to do something, to tie something, and you know it's disposable. When you're done with it, you toss it in your rope drawer, and you go buy another one of these to toss back in the glove box. This way, it's not getting tangled, it's not taking up space. It's just a a handy quantity of nicely packed rope that you can keep in the trunk, keep in your go bag, keep in your backpack, keep in your glove box of your car, keep in your bike bag on your bike, whatever. You know, you gotta lash something to your bike, you lash something to your car. It's just handy. It's a dollar. I mean, hello. It's it's a nice little bit of rope for a buck. It's hard to argue with that kind of price. But that's it. Just a couple other cable colors. You know, I'll play with them. I'll see how durable they are. If they end up being good. If I can test them fast enough before they run out of them, then I go get more if I like them. And if I don't like them, I give them away. <laughs> but, um, I'm also going to have a review of these lights soon. Uh, there's no easy way for me to show you one of them, but I'll show you when I review them. They are freaking amazing. They're beautiful. I love them. Um, the only thing I don't like is I can't remotely turn them on and off. I like lights that if I hook them up to a switch, I can turn them off and then they will resume their... Um, last state when I power them back on. These don't. But they do have the advantage of um, being adjustable in both position, height, and color. So actually, let me change this for you while I'm here. So like here is warm white, and here's a mix of warm and cold, and here's day white. So I can actually change the color and the intensity of the light. These things are actually pretty darn cool. I have one for each printer setup. I only got four of them. Um, I wish I'd have gotten more when I had got them on sale. But um, I got they they're, they're, they work beautifully with the the Yi action cameras. They provide more, even at I don't keep them at full brightness. I keep them about half, and it's a perfect amount of light to light up the print that's printing for the camera to capture it. You'll be seeing it in all my current time lapses, and it works great. No problems, no complaints. I mean, it's plenty of light and good CRI, good color rendition. And um, I like them. They're cool, and they look nice. You know, they're no, you, the, the the end swivels and pivots, and the arm pivots, so I can position it where I want over the printer. Um, I might even eventually dismantle it and make that part of the printer and build the base into the printer, because I think I'm going to have a hardcore modification series for the um, the Maker Selects. The ANA E10 and the um, the CR10s. What I want to do is I want to put a I want to get more pieces of the 2040 rail that the printer is made of and make the printer taller, raise it up off the ground a little more, 
and put a plywood base underneath the printer at the bottom and then I want to get rid of the brain box altogether and have everything built into the bottom of the printer the power supply, the melty board, the MOSFET, all of it, the fans, everything built into the bottom of the printer so that um, the printer will have a fixed footprint without a separate control box and the wires will be hard mounted to wherever they have to go except for the two that have to go up with the um, printer and the filament will mount on top of the printer like the mono price maker selects do um, people worry about print quality with that but the, the CR10 and the ANA E10 are so rigid that's not a problem it's just not I mean that's got the spool on top <laughs> it, it's this little tiny printer and the spool is right up top and you see what I get out of it okay mounting a spool up top does not affect print quality unless your printer has crap rigidity okay so as long as your printer is nice and rigid that's not a problem I mean, well to a point obviously um, so that will allow me to because right now I have a tough time actually I can show you hang on here <sighs> ah you got a sneak peek but anyway you can see um, I had to turn the E10 sideways here so that I'd have enough space for the two CR10s to fit on this table and this table is gigantic um, so if I could have the control boxes underneath the printer so basically get two more pieces of this rail and triple the height here and have a plywood base and have all the electronics from there in here so that leaves me with a question that maybe you guys can help me answer Damn, this is a long video. We're approaching one hour. <laughs> That's about 54 minutes, I think. Um, so we're going to end this really soon. Um, maybe you guys can help me with this. What I need is the wires going to the little four pin and three or two pin Mollux connectors, the wires that go to, that actually plug into the stepper motor and that plug into the limit switches. I need extensions, not rewires. I need male, female extensions. I want to take the existing wire that goes to a stepper motor, unplug it, plug it into an extension cable, and then plug the extension cable into the stepper motor. Because while I think I might have enough slack on the ANET E10 to do this, there is not enough slack on the CR10s to do this. Meaning, the cable is not long enough for me to put the control box underneath the printer, to put the guts underneath the printer and have those cables have enough reach to go to maximum height on the CR-10. So if I've been trying to find it, maybe I'm using the wrong search terms, I don't even know what that cable is called. I've just been typing in stepper motor wire extension, stuff like that, you know, limit switch wire extension. If I knew the name of that connector, maybe that would help, but I need a male-female extension cable, you know. I don't want to have to do any plug dismantling, I don't want to have to do any soldering, I want to be able to unplug this cable from the stepper motor, plug it into the extension cable, then take the other end of the extension cable and plug it back into the stepper motor. Then I can just heat shrink those connections together to keep them tight. But I want to be able to extend the length of these wires without having to perform brain surgery on them. So if you guys know where I can get such things, I don't need much, you know, 12 inches would be plenty. 12 inches will allow me to extend any printer as much as I need, but this will also allow me to increase my Z height a little bit. So for example, um, I might actually be able to do that on the Ender 2s without much fuss. I would love to add another 75 millimeters to that, because I would only have to replace two parts. I'd have to replace this 2040 beam, and I'd have to replace the lead screw. I can already get the lead screw for like 12 bucks. And I can't imagine this beam would cost very much. I could probably just take a beam from a CR10, just order a CR10 beam, thread the two holes in the bottom and the two holes in the top, and just replace it. Done. And um, I probably couldn't get 300 millimeters of the stock wiring, but I bet you I can get 250, 260 before I reach the limit of the stock wire here to go in altitude. But that'll allow me to print taller stuff with my Ender 2s, which would be handy. It'd be nice to have. I'd probably do it to just one because for what I want to do with the Ender 2, I don't need a whole lot of height. Um, I'm actually, I was considering, because it wouldn't be that hard to make it um, swappable. I was actually thinking about making a modification to one of the Ender 2s 
to have it only print 100 millimeters tall, which would result in it being a very short, compact printer that's all one piece that'd be very easy to take with me. But then I realized it's already so small. You know, I, I can literally just grab this thing by this and just pick it up. It's such a small little printer, and you, all you have is the power plug plugged into it. That's it. I mean, as long as you're careful with the cabling and the wiring and stuff like that, you can, um, it's an extremely portable printer. You just pop out the power supply, grab the whole printer, and take it with you. You know, take the spool off, of course. But, um, oh, I also printed, uh, lead screw guidance for the ender. Don't like it. I'm not going to use it. Um, it's too tight a fit. It's a friction fit over the lead screw, and I don't want that. I don't want to be. I don't want to be doing anything to mess with that lead screw to mess with the incredible quality I'm getting. So I'm going to design my own plate. In um, I'll probably actually this I could probably do in Tinkercad, but I'll probably do it in Fusion just so I can do filleting. Uh, but I want this big enough that that Z rod can go in here loose, so it doesn't even have to touch the sides of this because I don't want it to hold the Z rod. I just want it to keep the Z rod from being tweaked because I don't know if you noticed this on the ender the Z-Rod is floating there you go you can see that so you can see here the Z-Rod just floats here there's nothing actually holding that Z-Rod at the top here it's just the connection to the coupler for the stepper motor and then the the sleeve shaft going the brass sleeve going through the um, the gantry assembly as it rides up and down that's all that holds that that Z-Rod in place. And that's fine. Mechanically, that's fine. I'm worried about abuse of me. Like, I go and reach and accidentally grab this and see how it tweaks that rod and it bends? I don't want to do that. Right? Or if something catches on it, if I go to reach over and I catch that Z-Rod on something, having something like this on top of there would simply provide a second point that if it gets tweaked, it'll hit a limit and can't be tweaked anymore. So that's important. Well, that's it. If you guys have a lead on the extensions, let me know. I'll have a mega print episode coming soon, and um, go from there. You guys have a great night.